amigas y amigos del Eco Exploratorio Museo de Ciencias de Puerto Rico, muy buenas tardes y bienvenidos a esta transmisión en vivo de nuestro programa Ciencia Virtual para hoy, para ahora, que ustedes están sintonizándonos a través de Zoom y Facebook Live. Tenemos al doctor Lance Bush, quien es el CEO y presidente del Challenger Center y nuestra meteoróloga Ada Monzón en una entrevista única. A conversation with rocket scientist and educator. Esta entrevista, claro, está, va a estar siendo transmitida en inglés. El, nuestra meteoróloga Ada Monzón estará uh, llevando a cabo la entrevista y este servidor estará asistiéndoles a través de eh, los comentarios y el Q&A en caso de que ustedes deseen enviar alguna preguntita para Ada y para el doctor Lance Bush. Si usted nos está viendo a través de Facebook Live, recuerde que nos puede enviar sus preguntas y comentarios a través del área de comments, de los comentarios aquí al ladito. Y si nos está viendo a través de Facebook Live, eh, perdón, de Zoom, aquí abajito va a encontrar el botoncito que dice Q&A o QIA. En ese espacio usted va a poder entonces enviarnos sus saludos, pero también enviarnos sus preguntas. Nuestra meteoróloga Ada Monzón estará seleccionando alguna de ellas para a través de la entrevista, poderlas hacer al director y al CEO y presidente del Challenger Center, el doctor Lance Bush. Pero mira, mi gente, no les tomo más tiempo porque antes de ese gran evento tenemos una gran entrevista y nos gustaría que ustedes eh, estuviesen con nosotros para ser partícipes de ella. Así que con ustedes, la meteoróloga Ada Monzón y el doctor Lance Bush. It's all yours. Thank you for being here and... Have a good day and a good inter interview. Thank you for that introduction. I'm um, really looking forward to the, to the discussion and being part of uh, Eco Exploratoria's uh, program today. Dr. Bush, what an honor and privilege to be interviewing today. Uh, perhaps what I want to have is a conversation with you and get to know better what the Challenger Center is and also uh, know more about the mission and how you uh, accomplish your STEM education through aerospace activities uh, all around the Challenger Center. So first of all, thank you very much for being with us at Eco Exploratorio Science Museum of Puerto Rico. Oh, thank you. Um, it's an honor to, to be here, and I um, know a little bit about the work you're doing there in Puerto Rico and out of your, your work over the years, and I'm grateful uh, to you for, you know, uh, the inspiration you're providing to, you know, three million uh, people in Puerto Rico in terms of bringing science alive, and uh, so anything I can do to help there, uh, I'm privileged to do. So, Dr. Bush, so t tell me about your background. I know that you are a rocket scientist. What do you mean by that? Do, uh, have you worked with uh, um, work with uh, the commercial side of the aerospace industry? Um, thank you. Yeah, I've, I've had a very fortunate career um, in my mind. It's just a string of wonderful, uh, engaging jobs. I started my career at NASA as one of the chief space vehicle designers uh, at NASA Langley Research Center. Um, and that is the mentors for me when I started were the people who designed Mercury, Gemini, Apollo, um, and they handed down their knowledge base. And uh, I am old enough uh, that my first year there, I overlapped with the last year of Katherine Johnson for those of your viewers who have seen Hidden Figures. So I actually, exactly. I'm, now I'm revealing just how old I really am. Uh, <laughs> no but, way. <laughs> uh, so uh, I went from there. I spent 20 years at NASA. Eventually, uh, was elevated to the point that I was managing um, all of the commercial activities for space station uh, for NASA and across the 16 countries. And we helped really actually introduce uh, commercial uses of space. Um, and even uh, I was uh, in that position when we had the first commercial space tourist. Um, go up, and um, I left NASA at one point uh, with a heavy heart, but uh, a new venture's in front of me. It's something nobody, not many people actually do, uh, but it turned out okay for me. I ended up going and working for one of these commercial space companies and running it, um, and we, a uh, little interesting side note to today's story, 
is uh, in the early days, um, as SpaceX was building up, it was a, you know, it started like everybody, a very small company, and, and most of their folks were focused on, you know, the rocket engines and the tanks, you know, the largest components. And uh, our company, our space company at the time that I was running specialized in life support systems. And so SpaceX came to us and we designed uh, the, the baseline of their uh, life support system for the astronauts inside. So for today, today's a little special oh. too to see this, this work. And uh, so thank you for uh, helping me have a way of celebrating today being with you today. Wow, that's amazing. Uh, so it is very interesting also, I learned today that the, the launch platform that they are using for the launch of the Falcon 9 Air, um, craft, uh, spacecraft is launching from the same one that was used 50 years ago for the Apollo mission. That's amazing. I mean, yeah, there are well, some things that don't change. Yeah, it's uh, well, it's it's historic, but it's a testament to uh, even the engineering that happened back in those days. Um, and having met some of those people, they were amazing uh, what they did to accomplish getting people to the moon that we're just now trying to go back and they didn't have the computers or the tools we have today. Um, but I think, um, you know, what NASA is doing with SpaceX and the other companies out there, uh, all of them, Blue Origin, Lockheed Martin, Boeing, they're all doing incredibly innovative things and it's uh, the space community is a, a, a great uh, group of people to be a part of. They're, they're hardworking, they work for the, the vision of the future of humanity. You know, I, I did a live transmission of the last space shuttle mission back in July 2011. And I remember, you know, after that launch, it was so sad. I mean, the sadness that prevailed um, at the media center, everybody was crying. It was beautiful, but it was it was sad at the same time. So in a way, I mean, I feel so excited to be part of this history as well. You know, being, I mean, being able to be here and then doing the live transmission, even from home, you know, of the next step toward, you know, space exploration. But at the same time, we are under the COVID and then we cannot go over there. And actually, NASA Kennedy is asking everyone to stay home and not go into the observation points because it's not safe. So it's kind of sad and also, you know, we're cheerful, but at the same time, we're sad that we cannot celebrate as it should be. Well, hey, look, um, yeah, I know these, these times are tough, but, um, and maybe it's because of my background, we, you know, having worked in space where it's uh, timelines for some of these missions, when you're designing a space vehicle, it would be 20 years down the road. So to me, the 10 years of, you know, not flying was a blink. In fact, in fact, mm -hmm. um, what's happened since and even happening now, it, uh, NASA uh, did some incredible things. I mean, we found um, thousands of planets which have potential habitability, you know, or potentially habitability also right. started identifying that there is maybe life just in our solar system, in our little neighborhood. Um, you know, we've, we've really refined uh, views of the cosmos that we're looking at. So, um, you know, I, I still look at it as all positive, we're moving forward. Um, and, you know, again, the things we're doing now are, are leaps forward in terms of technology and so, uh, in the whole scheme of the length of humanity, I know it's uh, for us that are optimists. We want to see more progress, but this is this is still all amazing. So, you know, yeah, we'll I, th I think it's a bright it. future, right? I mean, and I think it's a bright future, and and also we got so many generations of kids right now um, that you know they they look up, they they are looking forward to this new era of space exploration. And I'm thinking more of the generation Artemis. And perhaps you can explain a little bit about what is this next step of the exploration program? Yeah, so, um, you know, we're, uh, thanks for bringing up generation Artemis uh, for my, my friends at NASA um, and uh, leading the way. Uh, we are taking the next steps um, to, uh, to, to see how humanity can go out into space. I mean, we've been there, but in the past, the Apollo mission, which was a Herculean effort, 
Um, it just got us there. We were showing that we could do it. We could drop people back. But these were very short stays. Generation Artemis is you know, going to send people out for long-term missions to prove that we can live out in the cosmos. And you see a lot of the efforts in, in behind this is looking at uh, sustainability for life and here and out in the cosmos. And I mean, that's, that's like science fiction stuff. So pretty cool. Stuff. Right. We're living it right now. Dr. Bush, so, you know, also grew up with the Challenger experience and now you are directing the Challenger Center. How, how does that empower you or, or give you strength to keep moving forward to make this future generation of space ex explorers a reality? Uh, Ada, you, you, uh, you, 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 uh, gave me the question that goes right into my heart um, sometimes. Uh, you know, Challenger Center was uh, born out of love and dedication. Uh, if we just start with the crew of the Space Shuttle Challenger 51L, they, these were, they, they're dedicated to a crew to inspire a generation, not just a generation, generations of students. This was going to be the teacher in space mission. And it wasn't just that teacher, but the whole crew embraced this and was a part of it. Um, and, uh, you know, children from around the globe were watching this and, you know, it ended in, in tragedy, but um, the families of the crew uh, said they didn't want this to have been in vain. And they bonded together with some leaders at NASA, Congress, at all the educators around the country and said, what can we do to make this better? And they said, you know, let's, let's have the kids be inspired. Let's have them be engaged. And, and you know what, maybe we can do it in an even better way. Instead of them watching a launch, let's have them be in a, let's have them run a space mission themselves and let's include the standards of learning in it. And let's show them teamwork and communication, critical problem solving that happens in every mission. And that was, you know, 35 years ago, they came up with that idea. And it, you know, most people didn't have a personal computer. So today it's, it's happening. Um, we've worked with almost 6 million students to date, about a quarter of a million every year. Um, and for me personally, you know, I mean, you asked me about this personally. Um, I've been, you know, I started NASA. I was working at NASA when the Challenger accident happened. So, and I was one of those people who was charged with designing space. So it's really not lost on me how important my job was um, and uh, keeping people alive and realizing that how important it is for me to motivate the next generation um, and so now later in my life, getting to have this opportunity, I have to tell you, you know, people are, are impressed by the fact that I was a, you know, kind of former rocket, I was a rocket scientist and I said, you know, it was a great job, but right now the job I have now at Challenger Center is the best job I've ever had watching kids, uh, emotionally transform kids who are underserved from tough areas and, and then seeing them later in life become scientists, engineers. Uh, teachers, uh, you know, they and and be happy about where they are in life and making contributions. So thank you for asking that. It's a very personal question. I mean, we we are scientists, right? But um, a scientist without passion or emotions, or you know, knowing where your roots are, it's impossible to grow. Um, you you are here to serve, and that's something very important that I. I want every scientist, at least from Puerto Rico, to know that there's a purpose and there's a mission that goes beyond us. You know, what, what, what is the driver of what we do? It has to have a purpose. And once you find it, you're a very happy person because then you have accomplished so many things and now you can do these wonderful things to like pay forward, right? Something, something in that in that line. I feel the same way. So I, I definitely understand. Now, how how the you are in a setup? I see you. I see you in a setup, which is a beautiful setup. Nothing like mine. I love your setup because it's like you are in a in the space. You're in a space capsule. Tell me about it. So this is actually so I you know uh, it is it is a backdrop, a green screen, but <laughs> you know I. I I'm, the image that you're seeing behind me is, um, yeah, I have been in it. It is one of our challenger centers uh, in, uh, actually this one's in the state of Texas, at a, a, a community college where they actually do work with a lot of underserved children in that neighborhood and help them find a way 
uh, to college. A lot of people, their families have never been to college. And, um, but this is within the spacecraft. This is where students uh, would be flying their mission. Uh, you can see some of the workstations behind me. They're hands-on experiment, experiment, uh, experiments that are part of the, uh, the simulation. Um, and you can imagine how inspiring it is to be in there while you're, you know, you think you're going to the moon, Mars. There, there are children of a certain age that at the end of the day, you can't disavow them of the fact that they went to space. They actually believe they left and went to space. And, uh, you know, like I like to point out, hey, Mars is in space, Venus is in space, Sun is in space, Earth is actually in space. So they were in space that day. Don't, don't tell them they weren't. So, um, exactly. yeah, this is, this is one of our uh, spacecraft. I, I love the fact that I've, I've been in the Challenger Center in Tallahassee, and uh, I was surprised on how the kids were behaving. They were so excited. They all had, they all learned, actually, they all learned a very important skill, and that is team collaboration. I love the fact that you have these groups of kids that they had missions and they had to accomplish just like in real life, and not only in NASA but also in any kind of job, yeah. you need to work in teams. And, and I think that that was a very good uh, thing about the Challenger Center program. Thank you. Yeah, it's actually one of the distinguishing features of us. There's a lot of great STEM programming out there now. Uh, I'm glad to see more and more people uh, providing STEM engagement. Um, but one of the things that's really tough to do in, in traditional school settings, in any setting, uh, you, you can probably attest to it yourself or, you know, if, you have if anybody who has kids or, or students out there now, you know how hard it is to do team projects. Uh, mm -hmm. But when we do it here in the simulator, it's, it's just like Na a NASA mission. We model ourselves on these NASA missions. And if you've seen the Apollo 13 movie, um, for any of those you've, you've you've seen it, we do a very similar thing where there's uh, what we call an off-nominal situation, meaning, oh, people could die. Uh, it's a nice way for us to say something like that. Um, and uh, ours is simulated, of course, but um, you know, it, it, it raises your anxiety level, you're working hard, um, but you have, to, you have to communicate from the mission control up to the spacecraft. There might be a team that's remote sensing, that's uh, has to talk amongst each other. This, like you said, this reflects the real world in which all of us work, um, but which is difficult to do in school. And um, it's one of the, the best aspects of coming out here that at the end of any mission, what you see is a whole mm -hmm. bunch of students all gathering around, jumping, high-fiving, and <laughs> that's true. how one saved the other and what they did and, you know, the great teamwork. They, and, and they don't really even you know, like uh, overtly understand that they did it and, you know, maybe in reflection afterwards, but um, it's one of the great outcomes that we can show them how to do that. How do you think the astronauts of the future, what, what kind of skills need to be developed for even not, even not even astronauts, working for NASA or any other space, aerospace company, even in Puerto Rico right now, the aerospace industry has been growing. So what kind of skills need to be developed so that we can uh, help kids to be more prepared for, for these challenges? Yeah, thank, uh, it's a good question. Um, and I actually have some inside uh, insight to this. Um, we work closely with, uh, and I've talked with uh, the heads of human re relations for, um, for uh, some of the biggest companies, Lockheed Martin, Boeing, uh, you know, we, we discussed with them SpaceX, uh, Blue Origin. Um, you know, they of course they want highly comp tech technical competency in their folks. But what we've we've been clearly told one of the big focuses for them now are you know what people call educators call 21st century skills. Some HR people call power skills. You can call them whatever you want, but basically it means you can communicate. Uh, you can do critical problem solving and you can collaborate and teamwork. Uh, those things are absolutely critical. You can't do the projects of today, these highly complex tasks with, you know, just one person, uh, the lone, you know, the, the solo star. I mean, you can be as brilliant as you want, but we need multi-process. We need a lot of us working together. 
Um, and so those are actually are the key skills, the skill sets that people need. And one other one I'd throw in there is, uh, you mentioned it earlier, kind of this ability to be creative and innovative and imaginative. Um, you know, while I am an engineer and you know, have a PhD, I'm the first to tell uh, students when they ask me what they ought to be doing with their studies, to tell them, uh, you really need to go take some other liberal arts courses. Um, because if you want to be great at devising things and coming up with things, you need to envision something. There's a blank sheet of paper and you need to be creative. So uh, you're actually, for me, you're talking to somebody who was, uh, you know, I was an aerospace engineer undergrad, but I had a minor in art history and mythology. And I think they helped, helped me immensely in, in terms of my creativity and thought. And so I really encourage that in, in the folks we work with. You know, that is so interesting because uh, you, you know, we, we all follow the, the trend of STEAM, right? Science, technology, engineering, art, and math. So now more than ever, I think that is so important because we think, okay, it was just STEM, but STEAM, I mean, I, the art part of the component is so important and so relevant for what you're saying. And I don't think many people understand that creative aspect of all of these, what it takes to go to the moon. I, I, I don't think we understand as regular citizens what it takes to put thousands of people together with different missions and everything has to group together with one sole purpose, which is taking these people safely to the moon. So to me, that is mind blowing. I, I, we went to um, NASA Me Shoot and NASA's Tennis in December um, for the Artemis program, Artemis program, and we were looking, you know, at, at all the components of Artemis One, and they were already working on Artemis Two, in Artemis Three. You know, so, and I saw that many people, I said, nobody can understand what goes behind the creation of a rocket, the creation of the program. I mean, it's just too big to even imagine it. But you, if you have these simple, you know, disciplines, you can do it. You can be part of something greater than yourself. Oh, uh, you're, uh... Ada, your, your uh, enthusiasm. <laughs> mm. oh, I um, love this. And, and you're right about uh, how you have to be creative about all aspects of it. Um, I'll just give you one little story and an example of how complex these things are and how many people we need. And, and um, it, you know, everything, almost everything you do in a space mission is unique. You can't just say, oh, we've designed, it's not like a car, like everybody's designed cars now have. Mm -hmm in a basic frame and you're going to modify it a little bit. I mean, I'm, and I'm not, designing cars is hard. I'm not trying to demean it, but I mean, every time you do one of these missions, they're, they're unique. And um, so to give, give you an example of something that people probably don't even think about with these launches whatsoever. Um, if, you, if you watch a launch, um, as, the, as the, the engines ignite and you see mm -hmm. some flames come down, there's this big, you know, just as the launch is happening, there's this big billowing cloud coming out uh, around the, the spacecraft, and it's very dramatic. And, right. You know, and a lot of people think that's the smoke coming out, you know, coming off the engines. Um, but at, and, and also, occasionally, will notice in the background of a launch that there's these large uh, water towers that you normally see in city. Hey, that's your water tower source, and um, occasionally, I think, hey, why are there water towers where they are, they're launching? And, um, you know, somebody actually had to come up with the idea and, and recognize that we actually, those water towers, they, they empty like a million gallons per second. Uh, those, they have like maybe about three of those towers. They, they empty out, shoot the water down into the, the trench flame underneath the, the, the rocket. They're spraying water in there. And that's that water gets heated up by the the engine by the, the exhaust and it right. becomes steam and it, it's kind of makes that big dramatic thing. And then you say, Well, wait, why do you do that? And most people think, oh, the easy answer is because we're cooling it down. Actually, the answer is because the rockets make so much noise that the actual vibrational 
uh, dynamics would damage the spacecraft. Oh, really? I didn't know uh, that. So you can, yeah. So you have to shoot, and the way to soften the, the, the vibrations is to shoot all these little molecules. So they spray the water in at a million gallons per second. They're spraying this water in, and all the little wa molecules of water are absorbing the energy and making it dissipate a little bit so that you don't uh, damage your own rocket. So Amazing. And that all happens in like 10 seconds. Oh, that whole thing is done and over, you know, it happens. The water empties out and it launches. That whole thing happens in 10 seconds. And somebody had, a whole team of engineers had to figure all of that out, design it, build it, make it work. You know what, now that you, now that you say that, I, two things came to my mind. One, when we were at NASA uh, Stennis or Michoud, I, I don't remember, when they do the test of, the, uh, of that exactly same thing yeah. of, the, of how the water flows, I, I thought that was amazing. I mean, I couldn't believe it, the size of the of the of the rocket um, um, motors. Wow! I, I was I was, no, oh, I, I I loved it. I loved it. But the other thing that came to my mind was the the fact that Falcon 9 launch will never be the same as this as the space shuttle launch. I mean, I saw the the. I mean, I I have seen many space shuttle launches and i saw last year a falcon 9 launch it was like is this it <laughs> so, <laughs> is this it i mean i never felt the pressure of the the wave in my heart i mean it was a very sweet and single you know uh, uh the flame was controlled it's, it's different it's just a different uh launch yeah, well, well, don't don't despair though. Um, <laughs> I think SpaceX and Blue Origin and some of the and 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 Boeing with that, there's the SLS that is being developed, the, the Space Launch System. There's the big heavy from Spa um, SpaceX and Blue Origin has its uh, you know, New Glenn, um, and these are all very large rockets that are going to be coming on online. Um, and uh, I think you'll be impressed again. You'll get you'll you'll, you'll get <laughs> the sensation. Um, so, um, Dr. Bush, um, I we're looking forward to a collaboration, you know, with Challenger Center, and we hope that you know in some time, real soon, we can get a Challenger Center for Puerto Rico. We're going to work very hard to make that happen. Um, do you have a final message that you would like to? say to the people of Puerto Rico, to the kids in Puerto Rico, um, especially about today's launch and about the Challenger Center and its impact on everybody's lives. Yeah, um, you know, you live in a special place uh, in Puerto Rico. Uh, you're on an island uh, surrounded by ocean um, and it's a delicate, you know, our whole, our whole earth is a delicate ecosystem, but when you're on an island, it's even more so. And um, we are, as humans, um, just now beginning to understand our stewardship of this planet Earth. Um, and you ought to understand that very well as a meteorologist, um, you know, with uh, marine biology and science. Um, and um, space plays a huge role in that. I, I want people to know that these things are absolutely connected. We do most of the, a lot of the research uh, data comes from space. Um, and understanding our, understanding other planets is how we understand our own Earth. We look at the models of what happened to Mars and Venus so we can understand what happens here. And um, we need, uh, we are going to need a lot of innovators. Uh, there's been some brilliant people through the history of humanity, but we need even more um, as we grow uh, as a society. Um, the only way to make advances is to have, uh, is to grow what's in here. And that's been limitless so far as we know. So uh, you young people, if you wanna have a, you know, a fulfilling, engaging life, and you wanna help out fellow humanity, um, be a part of it. Um, there in Puerto Rico, I think you've got some great leaders like Ada and the other folks um, who are helping at Eco Exploratoria. 
Uh, at Challenger Center, we're hoping to be a part of that uh, in York, in Puerto Rico. We'd love to bring Challenger Center there and let you have the experience of flying to space with your classmates and, and being successful and see what it's like to, to work in the real world and role play these mob, these careers. Um, so, uh, you know, to you students there, you got an exciting world ahead of you. Uh, if, if, you know, I, looking back at what's changed in my life and my grandfather, I, you know, my grandfather uh, came to this country when he was 12 by himself and there were only horse and buggies, there were no cars. Um, so, um, you know, that's, you know, my, my grand, just my grandpa, not my like great grandfather, great great, just my grandfather. And so, uh, you folks there, you know, you're going to be the generation who walks on Mars and does other things and maybe finds life in the moons of Jupiter. Um, so uh, have fun with it. Yeah, I, you know that we have an astronaut. We have Joseph Acaba, who is, uh, you know, from, uh, his parents are from Puerto Rico, and he's also uh, well engaged with all the education programs uh, in our island, just making sure, you know, he was a teacher as well uh, before becoming an astronaut. And um, he's a very good friend as well. And so we, at least we have a model to follow, right? In terms of Puerto Rico. And um, he's, he's always uh, very, you know, very welcome to ideas and also engaged, purely engaged. He brought the Puerto Rican flag to the International Space Station. And as a matter of fact, I will be interviewing uh, astronaut Randy Bresnik in about an hour and a half. Uh, we have a special transmission today uh, with uh, Dr. Gerardo Morel, who is the director of the Puerto Rico NASA Space Grant Consortium. And uh, we're, we're really excited. We, we would like to be the bridge between the aerospace education and the student and the teacher from Puerto Rico. And I hope that with the Challenger Center, we can accomplish so much more. We're looking forward to that, Dr. Bush. Well, thank you very much. And you're right, you have a great representative in uh, Joe Acaba. Um, I, I, I should, I need to point out that um, Joe uh, came to us a few years ago when he was ready to fly on the space station for a year with one of his other colleagues, Ricky Arnold. They were both educators. Mm -hmm. um, they came to me and said, hey, uh, would it be okay if we flew, if we took Krista McAuliffe's lessons? Krista was the teacher who was going to go up on the Challenger. Uh, we never, uh, in the 30 some years, we had, she, nobody had ever flown her, uh, her uh, lessons. And uh, so, uh, you know, I checked with uh, Krista's family and they said that would be fabulous. And um, so Joe and, and Ricky uh, flew them up in space, filmed them. They're actually on our website and NASA's. They're free up to the public. Um, you can download them. There's videos of them in space doing the missions. There's lesson plans that go with it for students there for you to use. Um, and Joe's got such a great heart. Um, he does. This fabulous human being. Um, you should be proud of him, really proud of him as, as an astronaut representing uh, Puerto Rico. Um, and uh, a lot of you, and I'm sure he will tell you, um, if he can do it, I know he's a special guy, but if he can do it, uh, many, uh, you know, all the rest of you can too. Make your dreams come true. That's true. Dreams come true. I, I, I know that. You just have to dream. You just have to dream. Thank you so much, Dr. Bush, for, for being with us today. I mean, it has been an honor. And I said at the beginning, a privilege for all of us to listen to you. And I look forward to see you soon as time and COVID permits, right? But this has been a historic interview <laughs> through Zoom. And I, I'm looking forward to meet you personally. Um, and please say hello to Jason Getz. He has been so great uh, throughout this, uh, these years to get this going. So thank you again.